By acts of war or accidents of peace, great ships go down, enter the final anonymity of the sea. Among survivors, each will remember a private fragment of disaster, a startled glimpse of eternity. We had a full lifeboat, and when we got lowered down, we drifted because we couldn't get all the oars out too far Well, away. we were always told that that ship could never sink. And then suddenly, it stood up on end, straight up, and it went right down straight. And they the never had any chance of getting to shore, sir. Never with that boat, never. And I propose to drink to the Britannic, to the splendid ship that you have been on board, and that had such a tragic fate. To the Britannic. In London, Captain Cousteau greets eight known survivors of the famed British hospital ship sunk by enemy action in World War I. And we were just uh, served with our porridge, and suddenly there was a big um, bump. You felt it well? Yes, you felt it, and the ship sort of rose up and came down again. And they, um, nothing happened for a minute or two, and then the captain got up and he said, ladies, you know what that is. Um, will you go to your cabin straight away, get your life belt, and get up onto the top deck as quickly as ever you can. Don't waste any time. Once we got all the ladies off, it was every man for himself. And uh, we just drifted past the propellers. We were just lucky we got clear. But we saw, I saw one lifeboat getting cut up. So I saw arms and legs go up there. They never had any chance. And if they'd stopped the engines, those people would not have been cut up with the propellers. Was the Britannic torpedoed or did it hit a mine? Which is your opinion? My opinion is you talk got torpedoed. I say torpedoed because as I told you before, that on the fifth journey, I saw the submarine. And it was a torpedo, if not two torpedoes. It was not a mine. Mrs. Mitchell, what is your opinion? Was the ship torpedoed or did it hit a mine? Oh, torpedo, without a doubt. Without a doubt, torpedo. Thank you. Now you, Miss. Without a doubt, torpedo. They fired without two a doubt, of them. torpedo. At least one, one torpedo. At least. It was a mine without a shadow of doubt. You know what Ruth Kipling said about war? No. And I read a lot of Kipling. He said, and I think it's the best thing to say about politicians in war. When a war starts, the first casualty is truth. Launched as sister ship to the Titanic, six months before World War I, the Britannic is also doomed. Then the largest ship ever built, she will go down off Greece amid charges of wartime outrage a year after being commissioned. Following the path of the Britannic on her sixth and fatal voyage, the Calypso heads eastward into the Aegean, stormy cradle of Western man. Here, past the shattered splendor of Poseidon's temple, the Britannic steamed to take on wounded from the Allies' failing Dardanelles campaign. Nearby, off Kia Island on November 21st, 1916, she was racked by explosions and quickly sank with a loss of 30 lives. For six decades, the questions have remained. Was the Britannic carrying war supplies? Whether struck by a mine or a torpedo, how could a single weapon have finished such a supposedly unsinkable ship? 
The answers lie in Kia Channel. At last on station at the point indicated on the British Admiralty charts, the Calypso sends a signal aloft, warning other ships in the heavily traveled channel that she will be unable to maneuver. A sonar side scanner fish covering a quarter mile path is lowered to augment the Calypso's vertical echo sounder and the search begins. Hour after hour, under the watchful eye of Dr. Harold Edgerton, famed electronics inventor, the sonar signals reveal a lengthening profile of the sea bottom. As the days pass, and the Calypso sweeps slowly to and fro on her search pattern, the graphs and dials give no evidence of the Britannic. Still no sign. Something is wrong. Puzzled, Cousteau widens the area of search. At last, the telltale trace on the graph. Three miles from the position shown on the Admiralty chart, the Britannic has been found. In a briefing session with the divers, Cousteau considers the difficulties of exploring the great liner's 50,000 ton hulk, compares it with a scale model of the Calypso's three and a half ton soucoupe or diving saucer. It is, he remarks, like a flea on an elephant. It is the two-man soucoupe that will make the first reconnaissance of the sunken vessel, completely self-contained, propelling itself by jets. The saucer can remain underwater for as long as four hours, achieving depths far beyond the reach of free-swimming divers. On bottom, the lights of the diving saucer at first reveal only random bits of wreckage a steel hatch cover, the crushed flotation tank of one of the shattered lifeboats, a broken mast. Then, out of the dark, looms a darker silhouette. On 
her port side, as if in dreamless sleep, lies the immense body of the Britannic. Later, aboard the Calypso, Chief Diver Albert Falco describes videotape made during the descent. We have first found a cheminée, some tubes, and then finally an enormous silhouette sombre devant us. And there, we were arrived on the coque. Though parts of the exterior are surprisingly preserved, even some unbroken panes of glass, a section of wood paneling near the bridge. The hull's iron plates from stem to stern are encrusted with oysters, coral, sponges, and other sea growth. Though some of the huge liners, 2,000 portholes, were open at the time of the explosion, it had little effect on the swiftness with which she sank, despite a commonly held belief. Yet in the brief 55 minutes before she went down, calm and orderly procedures affected the rescue of almost all the 1136 medical personnel and crew aboard. The size of the wreck makes any general view impossible. Like a monstrous man-made reef, it rises from sea bottom, 94 feet high and nearly 900 feet long. Search of its vast bulk for possible war contraband, Cousteau now realizes, will demand the most detailed organization to be accomplished safely. The depth of the Britannic creates serious problems. Returning to Marina Zia near Athens, the Calypso takes on helium to mix with oxygen and nitrogen for the dives, thus preventing narcosis and the often fatally impaired judgment that results. An SDC, or submersible decompression chamber, also is taken aboard to relieve divers from long periods of waiting in the frigid water. decks and holds crammed with special equipment, the Calypso hurries back to Kia Channel. Also on board is a highly interested observer, the vice president of the Titanic Historical Society. Long a student of ship disasters, William Tantum speculates on causes of the Britannic sinking. What I think happened, I put myself in that man's mind consciously. This area had been swept the mines two or three days previously. Oh. All right? And the submarine should, uh, the soap comes up and they take a look. The first thing you're going to see is a great deal of people moving around on the deck. And these people are members of the R Royal Army Medical Corps, the RAMC. -R and they wore khaki uniforms, the officers, very similar to the, to the regular army. The nurses and the orderlies wore a different type of khaki, a lighter khaki. But the officers who were on the, on the first class deck area wore regular military type of uh, collars and hats. And at 8, 10 or 8, 8 o'clock in the morning or 7.30, they could have been moving from their quarters to the Grand Salon for mess. And uh, a submarine with periscope sees a great deal of three or four hundred officers and doctors moving in that area could have mistakenly taken them for military personnel and being a hospital ship on those grounds attacked by torpedo because this ship is clearly marked you should see between the number one and number two funnel she had a red cross uh, a green cross that was illuminated at night by 500 balls again the sukup is ready for descent this time as guardian of the divers exploring the wreck. Now from Scotland, a formidable visitor joins the Calypso explorers. 86-year-old Sheila Macbeth Mitchell, a volunteer nurse aboard the Britannic on her last voyage. Mrs. Macbeth Mitchell still holds sharp, clear memories of that fateful November morning in 1916. Oh, yes, 
one of the handful of surviving eyewitnesses. She today lives in quiet retirement with her 92-year-old husband in Edinburgh. Yet, invited by Cousteau to revisit the scene of the tragedy after a lapse of 60 years, she was quick to come adventuring. When the machine is in the water, we untie her and she goes free. And she's propelled by jets, water jets. And here on the rear, you have a big block of land that is a safety weight in case of emergency only. Yes. We drop that and come back to the surface. Okay. You see the saucer is going? Now. And there they go. There they go. The diver on top is there to unhook the machine. My father and my three brothers were engineers, and I, I like machinery. Madame, I, I would like to know a little more about, uh, about what happened that day when the ship was struck. Yes. Uh, you said you heard a big boom, or...? No. First no. of all, I went to my breakfast in the dining room. Yes. And I had uh, two spoonfuls of porridge, <laughs> and... It was a big bang. Oh, you held a big bang. Oh, yes. Did you take uh, all your things from your cabin? Oh, no. Now, in the little uh, a green knitted bag by my berth, I was on just under the porthole. It's a very nice little traveling co crocodile my brother gave me. Folds up like a cigarette case. A little alarm and luminous top. If you find it... It's uh, in cabin it's number 15. It, to be there, and it won't work, but it'd be a nice souvenir. <laughs> The first team of divers, Raymond Call, Ivan Jacoletto, and Van Dan, prepares for descent. A veteran specialist in deep diving, Dr. Pierre Cabarou stands by, a constant, vigilant presence. In his heavy, oversized tanks, each diver carries a carefully prescribed breathing mixture of helium, nitrogen, and oxygen, adjusted to the extreme depth of the dive, a formula determined through years of trial and analysis. In coming days, with Falco, Patrick Delamont, and Captain Cousteau himself, the Calypso team will make no fewer than 68 man dives to search the Britannic. In the depth at which the divers must work, each man is permitted no more than 15 minutes before he must begin the long decompression procedures. Because the minutes are counted from the moment of submersion, the divers drop swiftly downward. At 150 feet, they plummet past the submersible decompression chamber to which they must very soon return. Then quickly sunlight is left behind and they enter the endless night of the depths. Like a familiar friend in this alien world, the lights of the Sukup glow in the darkness of the bottom. Through the open hatch of the aft hold, the divers penetrate deep into the ship's inner recesses. A ghostly presence from the world of air and sunlight the corpse of the great liner now belongs to another element. Whatever secrets of past wars or holds contain, they have little meaning here. Now, in the dark, still depths, she has been taken over by other struggles, other occupants. The crab and the sea worm, the algae and the sponge. But the holds reveal no weapons. The 
Britannic has become a world on its side. Her decks have become walls. Doorways and portholes gape where floors ought to be. One of the three-bladed, 38-ton side propellers stands forever fixed. Now covered with sea creatures, the propellers caused almost all of Britannic's casualties. Lifted upward as the ship sank at the bow, the turning propellers drew the lifeboats into the blades, smashing them to matchwood as they struggled to escape the dying ship. Less visible than the barnacles and sea growth that cover everything, a thousand vignettes of human survival still cling to the wreck. The men of one stokehold never told of the emergency, who came to deck to find the lifeboats gone. The rattled nurse who left all her money under a pillow, but saved her fountain pen. Sixteen-year-old Boy Scout Edward Ireland, who worked with the captain on the bridge until forcibly carried to a lifeboat. Here, in a forward salon, a cluttered mass of hospital bed frames bears witness to the 15,000 sick and wounded carried back to England by the Britannic during her brief months of life. By a merciful irony, she was outbound when death came. The beds for the wounded were empty. Here at the bridge, Captain Bartlett once fought vainly to beach his sinking ship. Then, at last assured that no one was left aboard, he stepped calmly into the sea, was later picked up by a circling launch. The Shadburn, the internal communication system by which instructions were transmitted from bridge to engine room is now an encrusted mass. Over it came the command for the last futile attempt to beach the Britannic. remains of the pilot wheel is the brass strap that bound the wood. The handholds and the wheel itself have long since rotted away. With a gesture of triumph, one of the divers holds up a prized bit of salvage, the corroded remains of the ship's sextant. Near the bridge, in the comparative luxury of his rank, lived Captain Bartlett during the brief tenure of his command. Present at the vessel's birth and death, he sometimes may have reflected on her inauspicious launching. Born into war, the queen of Britain's luxury liners was committed to the sea 
without ceremony or christening. In the words of one disgruntled workman, they just builds her and shoves her in. the master. On each descent, after 15 minutes exactly, the divers exchange signals and begin their slow, laborious return. Waiting just above midpoint in their ascent, the decompression chamber offers a welcome sanctuary from the cold. Helped by the service divers sent down from the Calypso, the deep divers remove their cumbersome heliox tanks and place them in racks on the side of the metal bell. At last, releasing the mouthpieces of their breathing hoses, they glide through the lock at the bottom and enter the relative comfort of the decompression chamber. As the Calypso is assured that all three divers are secure, one of the service divers makes a final check of equipment and closes the hatch. Quickly now, the divers begin their final ascent. Hoisted to the crowded deck, the SDC is immediately lowered into the hold so that the sukup can be returned to its platform above it. Here, periodically breathing pure oxygen, while Dr. Kabaru gradually alters the pressure in their capsule, the divers will remain in limbo for the next two hours and 45 minutes. Eagerly, the crew examines the artifacts brought up in the basket from below. On the brass ring of the pilot's wheel, the manufacturer's name is still legible. The ship's sextant, it is believed, might still be restored to workable condition if submerged for a time in fresh water and carefully cleaned. At last, their long wait in the SDC at an end, the three divers are released from confinement. Routinely, Dr. Cabarou asks each man how he feels. Routinely, each man gives an affirmative reply. But Falco has been below in the Sukup. He knows that at moments they felt a little lost. Yeah. Here you are. Not very good. Here are all the, here are all the patients, and here are the nurses and the matron. You'll see here the boats hanging. 
The lifeboat in front of me and the one behind were drawn in by the propellers and cut into ribbons. If anybody escaped from those boats, it was because they jumped out and perhaps could swim away. You see, the boat was worth two millions, and where we were hit, there were high cliffs, and they wanted to beach the boat where there was sand, the other side of the island. And so the minute we touched the water, she went on, and the propellers were coming up. And, and turning. At the turning, and at the back it was a whirlpool. Mm -hmm. And they were pulling all the lifeboats into the, the whirlpool. And when she went in altogether, she just went straight in, mm -hmm. just like a dive, a good dive. And everybody's heart was in their mouths. When she was turning, of course, I was thinking, oh, my trunks will be sliding under the other girl's bed. And all the oranges and lemons I bought in Naples will be on the floor. <laughs> and where is my clock? Now, you know, things like that. We had lots of concerts. I've lost all my songs, all my best music. Now I hear somebody sing, and I say, oh, I had that. It's down below. I don't know what we were thinking about, all kinds of things. And the wreckage was floating about round us, and we suddenly saw notices saying, doctors only, nurses only, patients only. Floating? Be floating in the water. <laughs> because the matron was very old-fashioned. When we wanted to walk and have a real walk in the evening, she put this rope across, you see, yeah. to stop us walking. And one wag near me saw these notices, and he said, huh, surprised the old dame didn't put a notice to say doctors and sisters shouldn't drown on the same side of the ship. And when I got back, into Athens at night to go to bed. I had my French knickers on with blue ribbons threaded through, and ah. one was lost. And the other nurses were very uh, teasing me. <laughs> they said, have you given the sailor the blue ribbon in for that, in, in exchange, exchange for that, you see? Did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I must to Victoria. <laughs> when you received the, the cable from um, uh, from New York asking you to, to come here in Athens and Lord Calypso, uh, you were uh, astonishingly rapid uh, to uh, decide to come. Uh, I have had a very lucky life. I've been to many countries, yeah. and uh, I never thought I would come back to the Britannic again, no. And it's marvellous. Marvellous. Uh, now no. I am ten years younger than I was last Wednesday. <laughs> See? As the days pass and the search progresses, Cousteau himself prepares to examine the wreck. As usual during the search, Cousteau takes his bearings and plans his dive in relation to the Britannic model aboard the Calypso. Intending to explore the forward section of the liner, he is again reminded it is a world askew. <laughs> to descend the grand staircase, for example, his progress will not be vertical, but horizontal. With the unhurried precision learned in long practice, final preparations for the descent are completed on deck. With his diving companions, Patrick Delamotte, and senior team member, Albert Falco, Cousteau reviews the catechisms of underwater safety. It's 
Ouais. Dans un magazine, un peu, on va perdre. Alors, on va couper des calories. Ouais. Though their banter is deceptively casual, each knows that they will be working at depths where survival demands utter fidelity to the rules. On the exact basis of dive duration and the greatest depth achieved, Dr. Cabarou will calculate the decompression pattern and its intervals of oxygen intake. C'est pour quelle durée? 15 minutes à? 15 minutes à 100. Oui. Et 10 minutes à 110. Et 15 minutes à 110. In a final check, each sets his watch for the exact time limit on the dive. Ça, on connaît. C'est ça. Si on fait que 10 minutes à 110, c'est le palier. C'est ça, c'est 75. Et qu'est-ce que c'est Il est parti 15, 3, 0, 0. Il est parti As Cousteau submerges, Falco and Delamotte immediately follow, for already the clock has begun to count. As always, the dive is a race with time, a dreamlike fall to the bottom. I pass the decompression chamber without which there could be no safe return for any of us. Swiftly, I follow the braided nylon cable downward and soon drop past the SDC stabilizing pig iron weight suspended like a stone in the sky. Almost at once, I cross the barrier of darkness. Then, at 180 feet, as Falco and Dolmot overtake me, we encounter the cold, the chill that invades our wet suits and our spirits. At last, I begin to discern the colossal hulk. My depth gauge indicates 320 feet. It has taken us six minutes to get here. In nine minutes, it is imperative that we begin our return. I swim now through a world in which all reference points have been altered. The walls of the monumental first class hall are above and under me, the floor directly ahead. I weave through a labyrinth of metal bars across my horizontal course. I feel I could get caught like a tuna in a giant net. Abruptly, I realize that these grids are all that remain of the grand staircase. But a less definable sense of disorientation also haunts me. The Britannic's entire career was unintended. Planned for fashionable transatlantic crossings, she spent her brief life in the drab pursuits of war. Here in this room, where orchestras were meant to play, dust has settled everywhere in the Stygian gloom. History has made a mistake. approached the huge opening ripped in the forward hull by the explosion. While Falco films and Dolomot aims the beams of our powerful lights, 
I search for clues that will tell us more about the Britannic's tragedy. Soon, I am surrounded by twisted steel plates and bulkheads, by torn clusters of electric cables and rotted planks. I realize I have penetrated deep into the ship's entrails. Then darkness. I cling to a buckled pipe. My companions reappear and find me. What has seemed to me an eternity was only seconds. I remember the sudden fear, the line by Paul Valéry. A man alone is in bad company. Quickly, we go on with the search. When we reach the very bottom, the depth is 370 feet. Here and there, one of us picks up a bit of debris, stores it in the soucoupe's basket for later examination at the surface. Not far from the immense rupture, perhaps a hundred feet back from the bow, we find a piece of coal, apparently blown from the bunkers. A trifle, perhaps. My watch tells me we have reached the end of our short lease of time. I signal my companions. We withdraw and begin our ascent. Behind us, in the dark, we leave the broken shell of a technological triumph, a somber reminder that we too are vulnerable. The Britannic was once called as perfect a specimen of man's creative power as it is possible to conceive. She lasted less than a year. more than halfway up, the service divers wait at the STC. They help remove our air tanks and store them in the racks while we enter the warm haven of the decompression chamber. Back in the only world we can safely inhabit for the next two hours and 45 minutes, we are given a final check by the service diver, then begin the last leg to the top. Like workmen at the end of a job, we find ways to spend our leisure. We make over the intercom a few requests for some appetizers and wine. Boringly, Dr. Cabarou insists that it is a practical impossibility. <laughs> Instead, he prescribes oxygen according to the prepared tables for the depth we have reached. It is all very good for us, we agree. But as Falco points out, caviar would have tasted better. Oh, 
Obedient to the inflexible tables, we are at last released by Dr. Cabarou from our tiny world. Suddenly, the crowded deck of the Calypso seems enormous. With the finding of the coal, most pieces of the Britannic mystery seem reasonably clear. Nowhere have the searchers discovered evidence that the Britannic was anything other than she claimed to be, a mercy-bound hospital ship. Convinced that the rupture in the hull is far larger than could be caused by a mine or a torpedo alone. It is Cousteau's belief that the first explosion ignited the highly volatile coal dust in the bunkers and thus caused the almost simultaneous and even more violent second explosion that scattered coal outside the hull. I wanted to show you this is a piece of coal that we brought up from the Britannic. Piece of the coal? The coal with which they were used in the boiler room. From Naples, I think. Probably. 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 It's all poussière, huh? Yeah, it's all because it's humid. Enough. Maybe, do you think that's enough? Oh, sure. OK. Can I have that little bit? Sure. I'll give a bit to Monty. Sure. <laughs> so that's coal from the Britannic. Oh, oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. Almost certainly, the Britannic struck a mine. Found later, the log of German U-boat 73 reports leaving a hospital ship unharmed, though the U-boat already had laid mines in Kia Channel. Its work is finished, yet for the Calypso, one mission remains to be done. To Mrs. Mitchell is granted an opportunity seldom given mortals, the chance to go back in time for a second look. A lifetime later, the young nurse from cabin 15 returns to the ship where she lost a clock, some old songs, and a sack of oranges.
C'est plus joli maintenant qu'avant. C'est vrai. Ah, c'est vrai. Et c'est grand lobster. Lobster. Euh, lobster. Langouste. Langouste. Il a fait le euh, breathing. Yeah. Watch your that. Yeah. Il, a fait, il avait peur. Il avait peur, oui. Oh, là, peur de la sécurité. Il avait peur de la sécurité. Ok. Now we will help you out. Now then. Wait a minute. Il faut avoir des skis. Il faut avoir des skis. J'ai rencontré un mari sur les skis. En Suisse. En Suisse. En Suisse. En Suisse. En Suisse. Very good. Attendez, capitaine. Encore une marche. Encore une marche. Encore une marche. Et attention, vous arrivez sur le pont. Voilà. Madame, appelez le capitaine. I've never had such an experience. I can't. Bravo, madame. I can't. Thank you too much. I've never dreamt I'd go to any place like that. And my helicopter and all my friends. But don't forget, you've all to come to Edinburgh to see me. All right. And be <laughs> quick, be quick. <laughs> don't take too long. Yes. I can't last forever. Okay. You see? I think you probably will. I think you're in a good shape. Well, you're in good shape for a long time. I try my best. Okay. Again, Calypso's guest has packed her bags. Like a captured truant, Sheila Macbeth Mitchell prepares to leave the wine-dark seas of Homer and of youth and return to the endless adventure of everyday life. So, each has been touched by a bright and indestructible lady. On whatever future journeys she may make, she carries from each a silent wish. Bon voyage, Mrs. Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> 